Years ago, while wandering the Yale University bookstore, our guest Stephen Greenblatt stumbled upon a discounted translation of a poem written by Lucretius in 50 BCE called On the Nature of Things. He found the book enthralling and not just because of the sexy cover. Stephen Greenblatt's new book, The Swerve, is about how an Italian book hunter stumbled upon that same poem almost 600 years ago in a German monastery. According to Greenblatt, the manuscript would influence modern thought and inspire people like Galileo, Shakespeare, Thomas Jefferson, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, and other great thinkers and artists. It's a revolutionary text that described atoms, natural selection, and a world without gods and all that that meant. Stephen Greenblatt is the Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University, the general editor of the Norton Shakespeare, also the general editor of uh, the Norton Anthology of English Literature, the author of 11 books, including Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare, and Stephen Greenblatt, nice to have you with us on Radio Times. Thanks, Marty. Nice to be here. Nice to have you here. Let me begin with you, and going back to your uh, to your college days, you stumbled upon this book. It was uh, discounted to 10 cents. You bought it. Uh, why did it resonate so much with you? Well, I didn't know it was going to resonate. Uh, Ten cents wasn't nothing in those days, but it was still a relatively modest investment. And I liked, as you say, I liked the cover. Uh, but then oh, sometime over the summer, I started to read it, uh, and my jaw dropped. I was amazed by it. I was amazed by it because so much of the world that we live in, that I live in, seemed already there 2,000 years ago. And it actually mystified me how it was possible. Why didn't I know that? Why didn't I know that there were speculations of this kind already fully formed uh, more than two millennia ago? You did say it's, it, it was a difficult read, maybe still a difficult read. There are parts of it that aren't difficult, that are just ecstatic and wonderful, but then you get into very complicated explanations of volcanoes, earthquakes, and uh, uh, lightning and thunder, and you, your eyes can glaze over a little. One more question about you, and this was uh, that it was in many ways a meditation on the fear of death, something that had really haunted your family. It's the center of, of this remarkable poem, is to try to teach you not to center your life on anxieties about death. Uh, and that was, uh, in my childhood, a preoccupation, not my own preoccupation, but it was uh, my mother, my wonderful mother, uh, uh, spent too much of her life uh, a anguished about the conviction uh, that she had that she was going to, to die. And I grew up as a child uh, very much loved by my mother, but at the same time very much given as a somewhat poisoned gift this uh, anxiety that about her disappearance. As it happened, she managed to soldier on till <laughs> she was 90, but, the, uh, but I didn't know that when I was uh, six boy. or seven years old. And, and did her worries continue through her life? They did. They, they, she never got over them, really. Uh, she was always sure that uh, it, it, her heart, which did actually eventually take her, was going to take her, but she thought it was going to happen early. But the point about Lucretius, uh, about this text, is it's very eloquent and articulate about why it's a huge mistake to uh, devote a lot of your life to worrying ab uh, about this. doesn't think you should be indifferent uh, to it, but he, it, 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 Lucretius thought that your focus should be on pleasure, not on anxiety. And you have to figure out a way of getting uh, so that you can achieve a kind of tranquil pleasure in your existence and a sense of the wonder of your existence. So was that helpful to you? It was hugely helpful. I mean, it seems naive of me perhaps now to say that a 2,000-year-old book actually served therapeutically for me, but it did. And it's funny that way, that things that you don't expect it's actually a deep part of my experience of life that things you don't expect will speak to you that are written by people who couldn't possibly know anything about you or your time or your mother uh, actually speak as if they've written letters directly to you. So I had with this poem that experience in a way that St. Paul said he had with, with the Hebrew scriptures that these were letters, Paul says, that were written for us. Uh, that, that's a, for me a very, very central experience of encountering the past. Well, let's go back to, what, 1417, and we have this Italian book hunter. He is traveling through Europe, going to monasteries, looking for books. I'm not going to say his name. I'm going to have you say his name. His name was Poggio Bracciolini. Uh, he was a papal bureaucrat most of his life, working for a succession of popes in the Vatican. 
in Rome, but he had early on uh, got the bug uh, for finding traces of the ancient past. And in his spare time, and he didn't have that much spare time, but in his spare time, he devoted uh, energy and uh, what little money he had at that point to trying to ferret out traces from this past. And he found himself in 1417 in an odd set of circumstances. He was in uh, southern Germany because the church, the pope whom he served, had come for a huge council uh, with the cardinals. And things had turned very, very bad for the, this pope who was a wicked man, if the truth be told. Uh, and the cardinals had the pope thrown into prison. Uh, and it didn't happen very often in the history of the papacy, but no, it happened at this no. point. Uh, so our friend Poggio had time on his hands. He was out of work. And he, other people who worked, he was the so-called apostolic secretary for this pope, secretary with very much that sense of secret, as in the word secretary. He knew the pope's secrets, but he could no longer work for the pope. And he, he instead of scrambling for another job, which many of his contemporaries did in this same circumstance, he seems to have taken the time uh, to start looking in monasteries and what were the, in that time and that place were very, very obscure locations. Well, he's a fascinating person, Poggio, um, famous for a joke book that he wrote back in, back in his day. Yes, he, probably the most famous thing he did in his life uh, was to write uh, the facetiae, they called it, a joke book in Latin. Uh, he was uh, someone who spent a lot of his time in what he called the lie factory, uh, the Bujale, the lie factory with his with his fellow bureaucrats, and they used to exchange jokes. And he wrote many of the jokes down. He probably made a lot of them up himself. They're not suitable, how should we say, for many of them Could, for the, uh, the radio. Even uh, today. They're very, very dirty jokes. Uh, uh, they're astonishing, really, uh, to think of coming from this place, uh, from the Vatican. They mm -hmm. often have as their, the butt of their uh, humor, uh, monks and nuns and the Pope himself and so forth, but the uh, the book became quite famous in his lifetime and it was actually, it s tells something about the very strange moment in the culture and in the church that it, it took a, quite a long time before the book as it was eventually done was put on the index of prohibited books, but for a long time it just circulated as something um, people laughed about. Now he talked about working at the lie factory, he was working for the Pope. He was working for the Pope and he was uh, like most of his contemporaries, grappling with um, the very, very, very deep uh, cynicism that that world was infected by. Uh, he understood himself to be working uh, for, uh, he was a good Catholic and understood himself to be working for the uh, core of the church in which he at least professed his belief, but he also saw too many things uh, from where he sat to be uh, how shall we say, to be very pious about mm. the world he lived in. He, uh, so he was a, threatened in a way all his life by collapsing into total cynicism uh, about everything. And the thing that saved him, at least I think the thing that saved him, was this crazy book obsession that he had. To just to add to that, he, he didn't particularly like monks. He saw them as hypocrites and perhaps seeing people that, that professed one thing and lived another way. It wasn't that the, in the case, in his case, he thought that the monks were, sometimes he thought that they were corrupt in the sense that they lived soft lives. Uh, but often he just thought that the whole account of that the monks gave of themselves as being holier than the ordinary farm laborer who goes out and spends his day slaving in the fields and then takes mass on weekends. He thought that that uh, account of themselves was untrue, that, that monks actually lived a rather easy life it's true they had to wake up early in the morning to pray, but he didn't think that was that hard a thing to do. So he tended to be uh, cynical about them, too. But he he had friends in monasteries. He knew monasteries, and that turned out to be quite important because he had to find a way to infiltrate himself in monasteries to get into their libraries. The libraries weren't, these aren't public lending libraries. Uh, and he had to find a way in, and he had to find a way of searching their books. His best uh, approach was to try to borrow the books, but clever monastic librarians at the time, if they had encountered any Italians, uh, Italian humanists before, said, no, no, you can't borrow the books. Because they, uh, they, they, they never they get them back. They never get them back. <laughs> uh, but he was a very good, he was actually also a very good scribe, and so he copied uh, things brilliantly. So do we know, or do you know, then, how he literally discovered this, this poem? Well, this precise details we don't know, unfortunately. Either be he was a 
passionate letter writer and somewhat something of a self promoter, but if he did write a letter about this particular discovery, it's it's lost, and it's possible that he didn't write about it because these people he wasn't alone in being a book hunter. They're all f- madly competitive with one another, and so he may well have suppressed the place that he went to with the hope that he was going to go back and find more things because he found amazing things. He wasn't just this amazing text. He found the great classical book on architecture. He found the great classical book on rhetoric. He found poetry. He found orations that had been lost by Cicero. He was a great finder. And one day he went into a library, probably in Germany or in Switzerland, I think in Germany, I think possibly a monastery called Fulda, but I can't prove it, uh, and he found this text that had been lost for more than a thousand years. Mm. But they knew it existed. And why did they? I mean, and, and just to put that into some kind of context, so this was written about 50 BCE. Exactly. Survived somehow, I guess, the burning of Rome? Well, it survived lots of things. It survived the circulation. I mean, it, it, it circulated. Nothing circulated enormously widely in the ancient world because literacy wasn't that widespread. But still, it circulated and was in its own time rather famous. Uh, it was extravagantly praised by the poet Ovid, who was a contemporary uh, of uh, Lucretius. It was read by emperors. It was commented on by uh, Cicero and so forth. Poggio was a contemporary of, not Poggio, Lucretius was a contemporary of Cicero, of Julius Caesar, and so forth. And then it circulated for several hundred years. Uh, but starting in the late 4th century, when the Roman Empire begins to crumble, uh, it diminishes. And by the 5th and 6th century, it disappears. Uh, so really by about, oh, the early 5th century, it's gone. Uh, it's gone for lots of reasons, Marty. Um, it's gone partly because lots of things go. Just they went. The libraries closed. The uh, schools closed. People, the empire is in complete disarray. It's possible. It's strange to think of, but it's possible for a whole culture to turn away from books, from learning, uh, from its cultural traditions, to dumb down. Uh, they had other things to worry about than books copying books and so forth. So the system collapses, and lots of things get lost at that point. But then this particular kind of thing got lost uh, in even larger numbers because there was no one who had a stake in such a strange set of ideas. The pagans, the pious pagans hated it, the Jews hated it, and above all, the Christians hated it. Well, on that note, let's take a very short break. We're going to get back to our conversation with Stephen Greenblatt, and he's the author of a new book called The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, and it's uh, based on the discovery some 600 years ago of a poem written more than 2,000 years ago uh, by Lucretius called uh, the Latin name, and of course the English name is uh, on the nature of things, de rerum natura. We're going to take a very short break and then talk about why this poem was so dangerous after this very short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The University of Pennsylvania's Fells Institute of Government supports WHYY. The Fells Institute offers a Master of Public Administration degree designed for working professionals in the government and nonprofit fields. Weeknight and Saturday classes help provide flexibility. Learn more about the Master of Public Administration degree and FELS at an open house on Wednesday, October 5th at 5.30 p.m. Details online at fels.upenn.edu. From samba to lambada, from bossa nova to rock, the music of Brazil is vast and rich. As we continue to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, we explore the hottest new sounds from Brazil with the co-host of the NPR Music Podcast, Alt Latino. Get your sweat on next time on Tell Me More. This afternoon at 1 on WHYY. Bristol Riverside Theater proudly supports WHYY and presents Cheetah Rivera, My Broadway, September 23rd through 25th. Tony Award winner Cheetah Rivera performs songs for musicals such as America from West Side Story, Big Spender from Sweet Charity, All That Jazz from Chicago, and more. Four performances only, September 23rd to the 25th at Bristol Riverside Theater. For tickets, brtstage.org or 215-785-0100. 
This is Radio Times here on WHYY in Philadelphia. I'm Marty Moscow Wayne. We're talking about how a lost poem on the nature of things written by the Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius in 50 BCE got discovered by an Italian book hunter in the 15th century and went on to influence Galileo, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, among others. And our guest is Stephen Greenblatt, author of a new book called The Swerve, How the World Became Modern. I don't know where to begin in talking about this this particular book because it is in so many ways so modern. For instance, uh, in this uh, On the Nature of Things, um, Lucretius talks about something that we would um, we would describe as atoms. Yes, well, they describe it as atoms as well. Uh, that is to say, Lucretius is not inventing this idea. He's following a Greek tradition of philosophy that goes back to Epicurus, who lived in the fourth century before the Common Era, and before that to Democritus, who lived in the fifth century before the Common Era, Greeks who had begun to speculate about what the universe was made of. And the, the argument that they came up with was that the universe consisted of invisible particles, indivisible tiny particles, the model for what they were was what they saw when they looked in a, uh, if, when you look in a beam of sunlight and you see thousands of little tiny things that you can't ordinarily see, the, uh, but that you in that particular brilliant sunlight see uh, are filling the air. They knew that those dust motes were not atoms. They thought atoms were very much smaller than that, but they thought that must be the model. The model must be that everything is made up out of these tiny, tiny particles and nothing else. And the particles must be moving constantly, just as dust motes move in, so that things that look solid, like the desks that we're sitting at, uh, are in fact not solid in that sense. They're made up out of particles that are moving. So they started there, atoms and emptiness and nothing else, no mysterious other mm -hmm. forces in the universe. Uh, and then they tried to think of what follows from that. And it's what follows from that that is the disturbing thing, because you might be able to deal with the fact that the universe is made up out of atoms and emptiness and nothing else, though that became difficult for uh, some people. But everything that followed from that was really uh, upsetting. Well, let me quote some things that you say in your book, because this is what followed. Everything is made of invisible particles. The universe has no creator or designer. Everything comes into being as a result of a swerve, which we'll talk about. Um, the universe was not created for or about humans. The soul dies. There is no afterlife. All organized religions are superstitious delusions. The goal of human life is pleasure. And um, the, the difficulty of getting to pleasure is, or the obstacles to, to pleasure is delusion. I mean, that is some of the most sort of modern ideas that, that we still wrestle with today. Absolutely. Not only is it modern, but no candidate for president, Democrat or Republican exactly. could run on that, <laughs> exactly. uh, that platform. But this, these are 2,000-year-old ideas. Yes, yes. the 2,000-year-old ideas, they, many of them are now foundation stones for, uh, uh, for contemporary understanding of the universe, a scientific understanding of the universe, and for our scientific practices, for what it means to get an MRI, let's say. Uh, but nonetheless, they, are, they remain strangely controversial ideas after such a long time, starting with the idea that, that the things that exist in all of their beauty and complexity could have come into existence without anyone creating them, without a designer. Uh, Lucretius thought that the, there were gods. He just thought the gods took pleasure in their existence and couldn't possibly have been fussing about uh, who's going to win the World Series or what country is going to be better than another country, let alone the fact that uh, you, I was mean to my wife last week. And or so whether forth. I have cancer or, or not. Or whether you have cancer or not, or whether your child has cancer or not. That's idea seemed mad to uh, Lucretius. Your book is called The Swerve. Taking all these ideas and kind of putting them all together, what does that mean? Well, it starts from a, a question in physics, really, uh, Lucretius and the philosophy that he's following worried about something. They worried about why is it, if the universe actually is made up out of little particles, why don't the particles all just fall in a straight line and nothing will happen? Uh, billions, untold billions and trillions of particles in the universe, they'll just fall down and fall forever. Well, they said, there must be some tiny movement, that's all it needs, tiny movement of the kind that now quantum physics has 
posited as the reality for atoms, there must be some tiny infinitesimal movement. That's all you need. Because all you need is to have the atoms start banging into each other. And if they bang into each other, some of them will repel each other, but some of them will connect. And then, if they connect, they'll reconnect and disconnect and reconnect and disconnect over an infinity of time. And in all of that time, uh, they'll begin to form things. Mm. And then he thought this, and this is the very strange set of thinking again from 2,000 years ago. He thought nature is constantly experimenting, and that's how everything that exists comes into existence. And that means that if an organic species comes into existence, if it's able to find food for itself and it's able to reproduce, it will persist for a period of time, and then eventually it will disappear as well. So that is to say he thought that there were other creatures on on Earth before we existed. He thought that there will be other kinds of creatures on Earth after we cease to exist. He thought nothing is forever, but he also thought that what enables existence, organic existence, life, living existence to uh, continue is simply the possibility of what Darwin millennia later called the principle of natural selection. Exactly, and that's the as you were writing, I, I scribbled down natural selection, the yeah. idea of of adaptation and and competition and and survival. Yeah. He, it was very clearly articulated in Lucretius, and it presumably was articulated before him in the Greek tradition he's following. But that Greek tradition is completely lost, almost completely lost. A handful of traces, some recovered from the carbonized papyruses that were dug up because of the volcano at Herculaneum. Uh, when Pompeii was destroyed, but basically everything goes, except for this one astonishing poem. And hmm. in a way, that whole philosophical tradition was hanging by a thread, and the thread was de rerum natura, on the nature of things, how things are, by this Roman poet. Now, Lucretius took some of his ideas from the teachings of Epicurus, who was a Greek philosopher, um, who believed that, that pleasure... Um, and the pursuit of pleasure was something worth pursuing yes. and was, in a sense, what life was all about. Yes, there were, of course, uh, competing ideas, and to some extent in the Greek world as in the, even more in the Roman world, the idea of pleasure seemed uh, an odd way of imagining all of life being organized. Why, what about virtue? Uh, what about glory? Uh, wealth, ambition? Uh, but Epicurus argued that if you watch living things, all living things, uh, from cockroaches to turtles to humans, approach pleasure and avoid pain. And that whatever meaning you will be able to construct out of existence has to start and really end there in the enhancement of pleasure for as many people as possible, the reduction of pain. By pleasure, Epicurus' enemies said, yes, so this is a great argument for overeating and, exactly. uh, and exactly. the sex. And, uh, but actually, uh, Epicurus lived a quite simple life, as far as we can tell, um, a even uh, a rather disciplined and ascetic life. Uh, we have very few quotations from him, but one is, please bring me a small pot of cheese uh, <laughs> for dinner. Uh, that, that he lived a very simple life precisely because he thought extravagant in uh, binge eating, drinking, and so forth is, a, is actually has too much pain uh, associated with it, that you need to actually have a moderate life in order to achieve pleasure. And that's uh, Stephen Greenblatt, our guest today on Radio Times. We're talking about uh, some of the ideas in his new book. It's called The Swerve, How the World Became Modern. And we're taking calls at 1-888-477-9499. So how did the church think about some of these ideas about, about pleasure, about uh, how the, the universe was created, what life is about? Well, the church has evolved in its early centuries, and particularly with the rise of monasticism had at its center uh, uh, an essentially penitential idea. That is to say, an idea that, that uh, centered, focused on um, what an early church father called God's anger, at hum uh, an anger that was precisely the consequence of God's love for humanity. If God didn't love humanity, he wouldn't be angry at humanity. And, uh, and God's anger meant that humans who had fallen, of course, because of mortal sin, needed to suffer. Uh, they needed to suffer and that Jesus led the way uh, as a model of suffering. Uh, as all good Christians of that period knew, the Bible 
uh, the New, New Testament says very clearly that Jesus wept, but the New Testament doesn't say clearly Jesus laughed. Mm. Uh, and pain, pleasure, uh, pain as opposed to pleasure became in a way the center of at least a very powerful current of medieval Christianity of thinking about what the meaning of life is so that the idea of life organized around pleasure seemed increasingly uh, to medieval uh, Christians a uh, an idea incompatible. A heretical idea? Well, heretical is too strong because after all, look Marty, people take pleasure. They took pleasure in the 7th and 8th century as well as uh, in uh, the 21st century uh, and uh, Christians believed in the incarnation they believed in the body they understood that that um, they believed that the world needs to be re to, to be peopled uh, and they reflected on the fact that uh, human reproduction is associated with pleasure uh, so they didn't want to eradicate pleasure completely from life but they couldn't believe that any serious philosophy would erect pleasure as the, as the mm -hmm. highest good that seemed like a uh, an absurd idea and and yes at the extremist edge a heretical idea but let me add one thing, Go which ahead. is that um, certain things were completely unacceptable to, uh, obviously, to Christianity, including the idea that uh, there's no providence or that the soul dies or that there's no punishment or reward after death. There were things that were utterly heretical, utterly unacceptable. But the church made a crucial decision early on, which was, as we would say, in effect, that it wasn't the Taliban, that it wasn't going to blow up the Bamiyan Buddha because it wasn't adequately Christian. So that if it was a pagan text, in the case of Lucretius, it wasn't going to be hounded down and destroyed as long as it was a pagan text. If you were a Christian and you took these ideas, you could get in horrible trouble. And in, in the very bad times of persecution, you could be executed for these beliefs. But many people from within the church actually were quite interested in these ancient ideas and cultivated them, which is why it was a, pap a papal bureaucrat, after all, who dug the stuff up. Well, it's so interesting because, and we don't know the answer to this, which is, you know, who who saved it from possible burning in Rome or destruction in Rome? How did it get to this monastery? Did they know what it was at the monastery? Did, did Were they there to protect it, to hide it? I mean, these are all, I don't know if there are answers to those well, questions. Well, we do know that it came, that definitely survived because it survived in a monastery. And they had a system, and not in all monasteries, but many, many monasteries were silent, as you know, especially mm -hmm. in the places in which uh, manuscripts were copied. And they, there is an elaborate set of signs uh, to request books from the librarian. If you were in on good terms with a librarian. So if you made if you made a good sign of a cross with your fingers, you could be given a Christian book to copy. If you scratched behind your ear like you had a louse, you might be given a pagan book. And if you really wanted a wicked pagan book, you could make gagging gestures with your in your mouth. And if the librarian liked you, he might give you a wicked book. So someone, <laughs> probably in the ninth century, must have made mm. the equivalent of that sign and got this very dangerous book to copy. A wicked book on the nature mm. of things. Let me get to Michael from uh, Concha Hocken to join our conversation. And Michael, go ahead. You're on Radio Times. Hi. Hi there. Um, I guess my question actually follows up on your question about provenance, Marty. Um, we know you're saying from antiquity references from other authors that a book by Lucretius on these subjects did exist. But it sounds like there's no actual documentation of copies surviving between, you know, sometime in the first centuries of the Common Era up until the 14th century. Is there any possibility this was some kind of, you know, fraud based on reconstructing references from the ancient literature? Or is that not plausible for reasons related to the manuscripts, internal evidence, blah, blah, blah? Blah, blah, blah. Thank you, Michael, for calling in. Yes, go ahead. Well, it's a very interesting question, Michael. I think it's not possible that this was a later fraud for multiple reasons. First of all, there are a certain limited number of quotations, not many, but there are quotations from Lucretius by uh, early contemporaries, uh, not maybe immediate contemporaries, but close enough, by Statius, for example, and others. Secondly, uh, there are traces of Lucretius all through the earlier Middle Ages. It just wasn't a book in circulation. So it's referred to by an 8th century intellectual, as it were, of Seville. It's referred to by others. Uh, in uh, We have records of it in monasteries going quite a bit back. It just wasn't in anyone's conversation, as it were, 
and there's also internal evidence of the kind that you say it would it it, it was a text that is in um, ex, uh, extremely beautiful elegant first century bef before the common era poetry of a kind that couldn't have been faked uh, in the Middle Ages, as we know from the many attempts to fake uh, early uh, documents, including the famous donation of Constantine and so forth. Uh, so, no, th th this is definitely a first century BCE text hmm. uh, that came back. Uh, Michael, thanks for calling into Radio Times. Uh, I'm stuck on this notion of pleasure because I think it's so provocative and so interesting. But um, th on the nature of things, Lucretius's poem says that the obstacle to pleasure is delusion. And I find that so interesting. I'm not sure I even quite understand what he's saying there. Lucretius thought that human beings have a tendency, and he was fascinated by the tendency, to want, to want things they can't have, to want to have infinite pleasure, to want to have unending life. To want, uh, when they're in love with someone, to possess and, in, and enter the other person totally. And humans can't have that. Uh, so they're constantly drawn toward uh, things, to, toward longings uh, that they can't have. And they're also drawn, he thought, to fears that are irrational. When there's a tremendous burst of thunder they think someone must be throwing something at them. When someone they love sickens and dies, they think they must be being punished. And he wanted to uh, free you from what he regarded as delusions. The idea that Hurricane Irene would be, or that an earthquake would, let's, would be visited on Washington, D.C. in order to punish uh, policies, as I believe a, uh, one of our presidential candidates joked, would have seemed to him the very essence of a mad delusion that can only lead to happen to unhappiness for uh, human beings. You know, that sounds so much like something Sigmund Freud would say. Right? Yes, and Freud actually, it's, it is interesting that uh, Freud um, was one of the people who, of course, read uh, Lucretius, uh, that influences on all of the uh, modern thought you've already referred to, it's not direct. It doesn't depend on any one-to-one -one relationship to actually opening this text and reading it. That happened to happen to me, but it isn't a, a universal characteristic. But you can feel the current that goes out from this text when it recovered and circulating again over centuries. This is Radio Times here on WHYY in Philadelphia. I'm Marty Moss Cohen talking with Stephen Greenblatt about his new book called The Swerve. It's about how an Italian book hunter stumbled upon a poem written by Lucretius in 50 BCE called On the Nature of Things, how he stumbled on this poem uh, about 600 years ago in a German monastery. That manuscript, according to our guests, would go on to influence modern thought, inspire people like Galileo, Shakespeare, Jefferson, Darwin, Freud, Einstein, and other great thinkers and artists. And I do want to talk about Thomas Jefferson. In this, in your book, you say he had five Latin editions of On the Nature of Things. He was a good Latinist, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was a very learned man. And he also was a man of his times in the sense that uh, people had to whisper about uh, Lucretius for centuries. They couldn't speak openly about it. The first English translation of Lucretius was not done until the 17th century very long time after its recovery, and it was done by a woman, a Puritan woman, in fact, who wanted to know, in effect, what the men were whispering about in oh, the other really? room. Uh, so uh, it took a very long time for the work to re-enter uh, full circulation, robust circulation. It was dangerous, uh, and you could get punished for identifying with it. But by the 18th century, Jefferson and the people Jefferson associated with, uh, Adams and others, were Enlightenment figures who read and weren't afraid uh, to associate themselves with this text. And Jefferson uh, loved it and wrote about his love for it. But maybe for our purposes, more importantly, he seemed to find some inspiration in Lucretius and in the whole tradition that Lucretius represented. And the sign of it comes really at the very center of our sense of ourselves as a, as a country. Because when Jefferson was articulating momentously what we were about, he said we were... Uh, about a country that would facilitate what he called in a famous phrase, the pursuit of happiness. 
not the pursuit of glory, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of virtue, but the pursuit of happiness. That phrase, the emphasis on happiness, is something that can, I think, be traced back to this uh, tradition, this lost tradition that was recovered. Well, and he's quoted as saying, I too am an Epicurean, and this is, of course, based on, on the, the Greek philosopher Epicure. Exactly. So he... he uh, at the end of his life, when, after all, we could have expected maybe he would uh, become more pious, uh, not less, he continued uh, to embrace this idea of the world as atoms and emptiness and nothing else. Do you think this poem, though, on the nature of things is how atheists see the world as we think about atheists today? Well, it's certainly the case that um, that people accuse this tradition of fomenting atheism, and as I suppose, I suppose one would have to say it is compatible with atheism. Uh, Epicurus and Lucretius, as I've already mentioned, weren't, as far as we can tell, atheists. They thought the gods existed, but the gods existed as, as models for what it was that they thought human beings should be doing, uh, taking pleasure. Uh, it's, I must say, a somewhat mysterious idea to me. But they also, uh, we, we should also say that Lucretius begins his poem uh, with the most beautiful hymn to the goddess Venus imaginable. So it's very strange to, if, if the poem is atheistical, it's very strange to have a poem that has a famously beautiful hymn to Venus that inspired Botticelli's Primavera. Uh, it's just a magnificent account of the, the, the triumph of love over war, the goddess of love over the god of war. Uh, and in general, Lucretius and Epicurus seem to think that if it gave you pleasure to go to uh, the Temple of Venus and uh, say a few prayers, go for it. Just don't insist that anyone else believe it and don't think you're going to be punished or rewarded if you do it. If it enhances the, your account of life and your vision of uh, existence to have some, uh, what he would have understood to be meaningless ritual practices, then that's fine. Mm. It's just the, the idea that you might actually kill someone for not having the same beliefs or that you would expect some prize for doing it. This seemed to him uh, a foolish idea, a delusion. And, and just to repeat myself here, as you write in the book, uh, th this poem saying the universe has no creator or designer. Yes, so he didn't think that, that uh, uh, he, he, he thought that uh, everything that exists exists uh, because of the swirs of the atoms yeah. banging into each other, coming apart over infinite lengths of time. And the idea that all, or, and this is a quote here from you, uh, uh, from Lucretius, that all organized religions are superstitious. Do you think that's Poggio and, and his, his struggles with uh, working in, in, uh, for the Pope, in a sense, that, 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 he, that that's him talking, or this comes from Lucretius? Well, it's certainly Lucretius' line. I think, I think Poggio would have probably wanted to get off the train at that point, because a good, uh, good Catholic that... He was, or, or modestly good Catholic that he was. I think that, uh, and that he particularly would have been uneasy because for Lucretius, the sign of religions being delusionary and cruel is that he thought that all religions as he knew them always come back to some story about killing children, uh, sacrifice of children. Now he thought, why did he think that? He's writing 50 before the Common Era, so he's not thinking of of how shall we say our great story about the, the death of the son. He's uh, thinking about the death of Iphigenia in the story of Agamemnon and Iphigenia in the Trojan War. But he thought that this was a sign of something that is, is at the heart of religion. And he thought that that was a sign of its, of its essential cruelty. I think when a 15th century writer and intellectual and, uh, uh, and believer such as Poggio found the text, uh, he wouldn't have wanted to embrace that proposition. Mm. Your book is called S The Swerve, um, and, and it's based on this notion of, of these particles that are bumping into each other, and, and in a sense, I guess, these, these chance encounters that can happen between particles. But does that also, do you think, um, describe perhaps how you think about how what life is all about, even beyond the, the particle nature of life? Well, it's certainly the case uh, for Lucretius and for this tradition that they worried about uh, if you think that the universe is all matter and if you think that everything comes into existence because of this, of this uh, conjunction of atoms, what happens to human freedom? Right. How do you choose things and avoid things? And for them, 
the swerve was the principle of the possibility of human freedom. They thought that the fact that everything was not determined, that there was something random and accidental about the conjunction of things, made it possible for humans to be free. And if you're asking me personally, uh, yes, I think that I'm, as a person, drawn, in fact, I suppose like most of us, to an increasing, suddenly alarmed feeling that the more we understand genetics, the more we understand the the, 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 the structure of our universe, the less freedom there seems to be in our universe, but, uh, and therefore the less freedom there feels to be in our lives. But I hold on to and believe in this possibility of something accidental, yeah. uh, unexpected, unpredictable. unpredictable. It's certainly true mm -hmm. in my own life. Uh, if I think about my own happiness, and I'm, I, have in, un, I have undeserved happiness in my life, in my marriage and in my wonderful children, I think that it must be a swerve, an accident. Oh. That's, well, that's interesting. But the, but the idea that, that, and I think we have probably the delusion that we are in control of our lives, um, but, but this reminds us that there are, there are chance encounters, there are things that we cannot predict. We I don't think, know. Yes. I, think, I think for both good and ill, Lucretius yes. would have been interested in uh, such phenomena as the, if he had been alive now, as the unexpected collapse of the uh, Soviet Empire, always, the, or the or the stock market collapse, for that matter, or our good fortunes at other moments, things that are always explained by our experts as if they had to happen, but only after they happen. Yeah. Before, they never seem to be able to predict them, and I think that idea would have seemed amusing to him and very much in connection to his account of the world. You describe um, the fall of the Roman Empire, as, as others have, and and um, what happened afterwards. Cities declined trade dropped off, the education system happened, of course the Dark Ages um, uh, appeared or evolved, and, and not to be overly dramatic here, but it reminds me a little bit of today. Well, I think it's possible uh, for a culture to go into something like freefall, uh, for it to uh, lose faith in itself, for it to lose faith in its culture and tradition, uh, for it to uh, become disoriented, turn away from its most progressive ideas, punish those people who seem to embrace them, cling to something uh, more, what it what seemed more secure, more elemental, and to have fantasies about what's gonna save it. But actually for Lucretius, this was, uh, would have been the sign of something falling apart. Yeah, uh, not, I mean, books were burned and... Uh, yes, or it's simply not read. Uh, it's possible for uh, there were plenty of books burned, but it doesn't even take book burning. It takes indifference. Uh, the, you have f amazing records, and some of them I talk about in my book, from the uh, later centuries when things are falling apart, of people saying everyone is just driving too fast in their chariots and no one's going to libraries. Uh, what does that sound yeah. familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, they weren't talking on their cell phone when they were driving <laughs> their chariots just at the same to time. Add to the but, you know, it's interesting to think about what if on the nature of things, you know, written in 50 BCE had not been lost, but it had somehow been enshrined. I'm trying to imagine what if we would have been having a different conversation, would, would this have been a different world in any way? I think in both directions it would have been a different world. It would have been a different world, of course. I think it would have been a different world if it hadn't collapsed, if it hadn't disappeared, because I think that the tradition of Greek and Roman rationality uh, would have pointed us in a different direction through those very long centuries of chaos and disruption. But I think we can think of it the other way around. What if it hadn't come back when it yeah. came back? And these are interesting speculations. Partly they're interesting speculations because they have to do with making you ask yourself, what does human civilization do? What, are the, what is the strength of the human mind? Uh, Democritus and Epicurus and Lucretius were entirely speculative philosophers. They had no experimental basis for any of their beliefs. It happens that many of the things they believe in now seem to us to be true, but they're true as far as we know because of different evidential, evidentiary base, because of Darwin's voyage and the Beagle and his observations in the Galapagos, because of the work done by physicists in the late 19th century, the early 20th century that led up to Einstein, not because people read Lucretius. So the question is, what's the relationship between these, uh, the, the extraordinary 
capacity of the human mind to think differently, to try to imagine the world, and then the work of scientists uh, and engineers to try to test ideas. And I guess I would say that what's fascinating to me about Lucretius, Marty, is that it's the greatest single instance, at least the greatest one I know, in which there's a perfect conjunction of philosophical, scientific intelligence and poetic power. And what happened really in our, has happened in our world, but has happened for centuries, is that the humanities, that poetry has moved in one direction and science has moved in another. Mm. And one of the things that I find so moving and powerful about this amazing poem and about the strange story of the little man who went one day and pulled it off a shelf and started to recirculate it is that it almost miraculously brings together the deepest poetry and the deepest science in one place. Well, in fact, uh, you're the author of Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. Shakespeare used this, this atomy um, in Romeo and Juliet. It's a very strange thing. He probably didn't know Lucretius's poem. Uh, he might have because uh, Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake for embracing uh, some of Lucretius's ideas, passed to England at the time that Shakespeare was alive, and he might have met him. Uh, he certainly knew other people who knew him, and he knew Ben Jonson, who, whose copy of Lucretius I've touched. It's in the Harvard right. Library. But whether Shakespeare know, knew it or not, I don't know. And Lucretius actually himself didn't use the Greek word Adam. He used a different word. But Shakespeare uses the word Adam, uh, strangely enough, in Romeo and Juliet, as you say. Yeah. And what's fascinating about that to me is not just that Shakespeare used it, but that he thought he could get away with using it in the 1590s with several thousand people in the audience who wouldn't have scratched their heads and wanted to say, what? Yes. So it was an idea in circulation or in the 1590s in London. We got an email from somebody who wants to know whether um, there are certain editions, I guess, of on the nature of things that, that you like better than others. His edition uh, translated by Monroe. That's a very distinguished translation, a prose translation. Uh, of Lucretius in, into English. And in fact, that was my own encounter with Lucretius was in a prose translation by someone that I like very much by Martin Ferguson Smith. But there's something a little melancholy about these because this was a great poem. Right. And what is um, uh, slightly disappointing is that no great English poet has ever translated the whole of Lucretius. There are some interesting modern translations in poetry. There are several of them that are uh, available, by Melville, by uh, Stallings and others. Um, there is a great translation in English by some of Lucretius, by th Lucretius's best hits, uh, <laughs> by the 17th century poet John Dryden. But he's a, he's a wonderful poet, but he lived long enough ago so that it isn't so easy for contemporary readers to read. But Lucretius is still waiting for, uh, for a great uh, English translator. Uh, to come along and embrace him and translate him and make him available in all of his poetic power. I tried to persuade my friend Robert Pinsky, who's a wonderful poet, and to translate to Dante wonderfully to translate Lucretius, but he said no, he didn't think he would do it. It's, uh, that's a big undertaking, it what do you say? It is a big undertaking. <laughs> 7,400 lines of difficult Latin hexameters. Well, Stephen Greenblatt, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today on Radio Times. Thank you so much, Marty. You're very welcome. And he's the Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University.